Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. And thank you for joining us for our webinar titled Optogenetic Activation of Selective Cardiac Autonomic Neurons. This is Liam Sanyo, and I'm very pleased to be your host for today's event. This program was developed through a collaboration between the American Physiological Society and 80 Instruments in support of their shared mission to provide education and value to researchers everywhere. Today, we have Dr. Angel Moreno with us, who is a postdoctoral researcher on the modeling team at IHU Lyric in France. Dr. Moreno will discuss how optogenetics can be used to modulate the cardiac autonomic system with a special emphasis on experimental preparation, troubleshooting, and data analysis and interpretation. And with that, I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Angel Moreno. Angel, thanks so much for joining us today, and the floor is yours whenever you're ready. All right, well, thank you very much for the invitation, and thank you very much for all of you for joining us today. I hope you enjoy this webinar. It will give you basic understanding of what optogenetic is and basically how you can apply this in your experiments. Before we begin, I just want to let you know a little bit of what we're going to be talking today. First of all, I'm going to give you a brief background of what is the autonomous system and why it's important for the, for the cardiac control and a little bit of what is optogenetics and a little bit of background of how that's, that does it work. Then we're gonna go into the experimental needs. I'm gonna tell you how you can create your model. In this case, we're dealing with a mouse model. So illumination techniques, like what is the, the best type of uh, photostimulation uh, tools that you can use some of the perfusion system that we're going to be using. And then we're going to, um, we're going to talk a little bit about troubleshooting and how can you um, analyze your data. And then give you a brief summary and what is the perspective for optogenetics in the future. Okay. So start talking about the autonomic system. The autonomic system regulates and controls many of the processes that we're not normally aware of something that is unconscious, such as respiration, digestion, and heart rate, for instance. When we talk about the cardiac autonomic tone, we talk about the prime modulator of cardiac function, meaning that this will control everything that your heart does when the situation arises. Meaning, if you need to increase your heart rate, you need to decrease your heart rate, the cardiac autonomic tone is the one that is going to be um, functioning at the moment. It's basically divided into two main branches, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic branch. When we talk about sympathetic innervation, this originates in the superior cervical ganglia, also in the stellar ganglia, and some of the thoracic ganglia. And it will be connected to the atrial and ventricles, including the senior atrial node or the SA node and the atrial ventricular node. We're talking about the parasympathetics, um, the anglias representing the nerve, they will originate mostly in the middle, of, uh, in the medial middle of size and on the vagus nerve. Most of the time, they just go uh, all the way to the superior vena cava in the aorta to the way to the ASA and AV nodes. Now, be more specific. So when we talk about a sympathetic system, usually it's known as a flight or fight response meaning that every time that you do exercise, every time that you require some extra energy, some extra oxygenation, the sympathetic system is the one that is going to come in place, meaning that it's going to release some catecholamines, such as norepinephrine, epinephrine, so no noradrenaline and adrenaline. It will accelerate your heart rate and myocardial contractility in order to meet the energy demands. On the contrary, you have the parasympathetic system, also known as a rest or a digest response or a system, meaning that every time that you're relaxed, that you're sleeping, that you're calm, this is the parasympathetic, this is the system that's gonna take place. In here, um, it will release uh, the main neurotransmitter called acetylcholine, and it will decrease your heart rate, your blood pressure, and contractility. But why do we care about the cardioautonomic system. Well, if you have a chronic alteration, this could lead to ventricular tachyarrhythmia, atrial fibrillation, any other cardioautonomic 
new patches, sorry. Any other condition that will impart um, or will diminish how your heart is performing, meaning you will have some, some arrhythmias that could initially not be little, uh, lethal, but at the end, it could uh, evolutionate to something more dangerous. So the gold standard of simulating the autonomic system is through electrical simulation and through pharmacological simulation. They've been around for decades. They've been good in a certain extent, but they also have some pros and cons. For instance, when you have electrical simulations, you can clearly activate neural pathways, meaning that once you hit an electrical shock or electrical pulse, you can definitely stimulate the, the nerve. But what happens is that if you stimulate a given nerve, that nerve will travel through different organs. So if you want to aim only for the heart, you won't be able to do it just like that. So it lacks a specificity, which uh, it also could produce some areas of D and hyperpolarization, which are not exactly what you're looking for, for something that is safe in the long term. Then you have pharmacological stimulations, which will provide you some receptor sensitivity inside, given that neurotransmitter are going to be binding to specific channels. But again, uh, once you have a bolus dose, either you inject it, you take a pill, that doesn't necessarily will follow exact release kinetics meaning that every time that your sympathetic system, for instance, uh, wants to increase heart rate, it will have in a specific fashion manner, specific kinetics, but you take a uh, bolus of, of uh, adrenaline, it will be huge. I mean, it will be instantaneously, but it not necessarily will recreate what your organ or your, the, it's actually um, performing. So at the same time, it's not selective. I mean, you want a specific, uh, you want to um, stimulate a specific organ, it's not going to be the, uh, the, the way that you're looking for. I mean, you take something, it will metabolize in different organs. Now, this is exactly what we're going to be talking today uh, is optogenetics, meaning that it's a different way of doing science, I will say. For me, this was like a sci-fi uh, concept meaning that, hey, at the beginning, my, my advisor told me, you want to, to stimulate a heart without putting any electrical stimulus just by channel light? I'll say, okay, I don't believe you. But i say, yes, this is real. And then I started reading and said, okay, this is really awesome. Initially, this was done for neuroscience, but it's been, it's been having a huge evolution since then. I mean, not only the neuroscience people have been using this, but now the cardiac people, we are, have been using this a lot. So I'm going to give you a little bit of uh, up to NH101 because it's a very brief introduction that I'm going to tell you here. So just like the name says, this is a combination of genetic engineering and optical technology, meaning that you're going to be able to activate light-gated ion channels and pumps that are attached to specific cells or a specific tissue or specific neurons without, um, with, without having to stimulate other unnecessary cells. By doing this, we're using some protein called opsin. Uh, the most common ones in this field are channel opsins and hollow red Um Specifically for this webinar, we're going to be talking about channel red opsin because it's the one that's going to stimulate a given cell. And by stimulating a given cell, I'm saying that you have a very high special temporal control and sensing because you can also um, have some sensing actuators or, or sensing proteins that not necessarily will control or excite or inhibit the performance of a given cell. Now, how does it work? In our case, we have neurons that express a channel adoption, but just like I was telling you, not only neurons are the ones that are capable of expressing channel reduction or expressing an option. It could be cut amount size, for instance. Initially, these neurons that express the channel reduction are going to be inactive, or the channel reduction is not going to do anything to the neurons per se, meaning that the neurons are going to behave exactly like it should be at that moment. Then we're going to photostimulate these neurons 
which has the, four, the channel reduction. In this case, we have a light that's gonna be shining around 465 nanometers. This is a wavelength for this specific channel reduction. Depending on the option you're using, probably this wavelength will change. It could be green, it could be red, depending on the one that you're using. Now, if the radiance of, of this stimulation is enough, channel reduction will be activated. And once you activate channel reduction, it's gonna be capable of generating enough photocurrent to generate action potentials. And only the neurons that has this channel reduction are gonna be activated, nothing else. This is the magic of optogenetics that is very precise, it's very specific. So now that we know what optogenetic is and why we care and why we need to, um, to find some different ways to activate the autonomic system, we'll tell you what do we need to actually put things in, into place. Again, you need a model. So in this case, we're gonna use mice with autonomic neural expression with channel relapsing. You need something to stimulate the, the channel relapsing. So I will tell you what are the main tools that we use and which one are the ones that we like the most for this specific um, experiment. And then since we're gonna be dealing with ex vivo experiments, you need something to keep your heart alive. Meaning that you need something that provides enough nutrients and oxygen to keep your heart pumping and happy. All right, so let's talk about our model here. We're using transgenic mice Specifically, we're using the configuration of crossing mice because this will allow us to produce offspring with a combination of mutations. In this case, when I'm talking about combination mutations, we have one parent that will have the either the sympathetic or the, or the parasympathetic um, side, and we will have the channel opposite. In this case, the sympathetic side, I call it TH, that comes for tyrosine hydrogelase, which is an enzyme that synthesizes the, uh, the neurotransmitter, like we saw before, adrenaline on the adrenaline. And on the other side, we have SHAD, which is choline acid transferase, which is the parasympathetic side, is an enzyme responsible for synthesizing acetylcholine. Now, when we have one of these parents, you need to combine it or to pair it with and then another parent that is the one that's going to have the channel relapsing. In this case, we have channel relapsing plus EYFP. EYFP is enhanced yellow fluorescent protein. It's very important to have this because this will allow us to visualize where it creates or where the channel relapsing is actually being expressed. Now, you have one parent that is homozygous, and the parent could be hemizygous, for instance. You have a hemizygous and a homozygous then you will have probably a 50% offering that could be used for experiments. But you have homozygous and homozygous, it's like 100% of the offering will be uh, of use. Meaning that you will have an offering that will have a TH promoter or a CHAT promoter expressing channel reduction. Now, how can you be sure that the offerings are the one that actually contain the, the, the gene expression you want? Well, one thing that we usually do is genotyping. So you take uh, tail snips, send it to a specific lab, and they will send you back the results, giving you say, this has this certain type of genes expressing your, your model. That's one, one way to know. The other way is through visualization. So we use confocal microscopy, and I'll give you an example how we do it in the chat. So the first thing that we do is, well, we take a sample from a heart, preferably from the right atrium, because that's the region where most of the sympathetic neurons are gonna converge. And after we treat the, the samples with primary and antibodies, then we apply a specific dye, in this case, the Alexa through dye, and we're going to illuminate that at 651 nanometers. And then we'll know that whatever we see there is chat. So it's just in the, in the neurons. Then 
we're going to see where the EYSP is. So like I was telling before, if you know where EYSP is, you know that's where channel adoption is. So in this case, we're illuminated at 514 nanometers. And then if you have a full overlap, means chat plus EYP, then you know that channel reduction is actually in or on in the, um, the chat neurons. So that's two ways to know it. Transgenic, um, sorry, uh, gen genotyping or doing confocal microscopy. Now we have our model. We're going to pass to how can we photostimulate this. So there are three main tools that we use here. One is surface mount LEDs, or micro LEDs. So I'll say a little bit more about those. Spotlight, it's a wide area type of uh, stimulation. And we have laser. Depending of, of which, which one you're, you're going to be using, or depending on the type of experiments that you're going to be doing, um, uh, it's better to know which one you're going to be using. For instance, in here, we're going to be using tissue or, or organ. So surface mounts, LED, and spotlight are the way that we're going to use it. But you're going to go for specific cells or a single cell of a laser is the one that um, you want. Re regardless of the one that you're going to do, you have to make sure that the wavelength is the correct one. Meaning, in this case, around 460 and 465 nanometers, which is the wavelength for exciting channel adoption. So I'm going to be talking today a little bit more, more about the surface mount LEDs and spotlight LEDs, which are the one that we basically use in our lab. Now, both has some con so pros and cons. For instance, the micro LED or the surface mount LED that we use, it has um, voltage, uh, uh, for a voltage of 3.2 volts. Good thing about this, uh, they're very, very small. So you can have a very focused illumination. Small level say like it's like a millimeter or less in the lens. Does not require a special software, meaning that you can plug it into your function generator or your or your voltage or, or static current generator too, depending on where you're going to use it. But you don't require specific software to to manage that. And it has a very low current requirements, meaning that you can use it with carrying up to 50 milliamps. Now you have the spotlight, which is a wide area illumination. As you can see, the lens is much bigger. Um, but the thing is with this, you will require a lot more uh, current and voltage. So this particular model will go up to an N and 15 volts. But it does require a special software. In our lab, we have a customized software that allowed us to manage all the configurations. Um, it usually requires more than 250 milliamps. At least for our experiments, that's the, the lowest current that we use to excite turn it off. So for now, I'm just going to be talking about the micro LED, which is the one that we mostly use for our experiments. But before you use your micro LED right away out of the box, there is one little thing that you need to do. Because we're interested about seeing a response by using photo simulation and not by using electrical pulses, you need to isolate the micro LED for current leakage or, and for thermal uh, conduction. So the very first thing that you need to do is, of course, you have to solder the copper wire to the LED chip. So by doing that, you just grab a cover of uh, copper wire and you just put it into a LED chip. And, and after that, you, I mean, the initial part is ready to be used, but again, you have to encapsulate. To do that, we prepare a mixture of PDMS, which is a silicon elastomer. It has a very high resistance, it's transparent, and it could be flexible, which is great for, for our experiment since we, we want to have some flexibility in where to put it. And we don't want to have any attenuation, any, any light attenuation that will come if you have some color, for instance. You encapsulate the LED in the PDF mixture. Um, the layer facing the lens we typically use around a layer of 15 micrometers because we want to have as thin as possible while having some insulation. 
The other layer, it could be a millimeter or two, just to cover enough the, the LED chip. And finally, you need to check the readiness. Uh, in this case, we use an optical power meter because you want to make sure that, that you have the, the um, minimum readiness to stimulate channel adoption. Could be, well, in our experiments, is from 0.6 uh, milliwatts per millimeter square. But I will tell you a little bit uh, later the excite amount that, that we use. Now, we know the model. We know the, the photo simulation that we're going to use. Now, we need to have a proficient setup. In our lab, we use standard Langender proficient. So you have enough oxygenation. It will deliver the software to, to myocardia. Um, you can use a custom flow. You can use a custom uh, pressure. It's up to you. Uh, and you don't need a dark room. I mean, unless that you're going to do optical mapping um, that it will require that room. In here, you don't need. I mean, you want to have the... Um, uh, a stimulation, I mean, the uh, channel adoption stimulation, you don't need that room because the wavelength of light uh, is not going to interfere with the wavelength required to, to provide the stimulation. And that's the little heart over there. So you can see it is nice and happy. Now, one thing that is very important in our experiments is to keep the temperature stable. Hearts are very sensitive to temperature, meaning that if you have a smallest fluctuation, you have a smallest increase or decrease of temperature, your heart rate is going to be different. Meaning if you have uh, an increase of one, two degrees, the heart rate will go up. The opposite happens. You have a decrease of a couple of degrees, your heart rate will go down. And why this is important, you might think. So if you want to control the heart rate through um, optogenetics, you want to make sure that that's the case, and there's nothing else um, in your experiment that is actually doing that. So to do that, we'd like to keep the solution around 37 degrees Celsius, and we use water jacket reservoirs throughout the system. You could recirculate the solution around your heart and always try to keep it at least half submerged. That's one way that you can ensure that around your heart and the solutions that are entering your heart are gonna, are gonna have the right temperature and there's not gonna be any fluctuations. Now, how can we record the data? I'm just gonna tell you briefly the basic tools that you're gonna be using there. I mean, you can go as fancy as you want, but this is gonna be just the basic things that you will need. First of all, well, you need a data acquisition system. And there are three things that I mainly try to, to collect. So temperature, ECG, or the electrocardiogram, and the heart rate. For that, you can use bioamplifiers uh, for the ECG, and you can use thermocouple for temperature. Again, you can go as fancy as you want. If you want to do optical mapping, go ahead. Uh, the wavelength for optical mapping most of the time are not going to be um, overlapping the wavelength to stimulate uh, our um, channel adoption in the one at least that we're using here. You can uh, record pressure data if you want. You can get oxygenation. You can go as fancy as you want. Uh, and we, we like to use AD instrument, but it doesn't necessary has to do this this type of instrument that we use here you can use whatever is more convenient for you now before we begin there's something else that i want to tell you um where should i put my micro led so this is particularly important for shad or for the parasympathetic side because since the location of most of the nerves are located in the right atrium, around the right atrium, you would like to put your MicroLED face in the ASA node. And I will tell you later why this is the case, particularly for parasympathetic. Um, for sympathetic stimulation, probably um, you, you have more freedom 
for that, uh, you can either use the spotlight if you, you, you wish, because nerves are allocating more places. Um, but once you, you kind of know which type of nerve you're going to be um, exciting, make sure that you have the, 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 the right position there. And make sure also to have uh, ECGs forming an eye hole and triangle because otherwise you won't be able to tell if your your simulation is correct or not or if you have anything at all. You can see here, well, you have this little LED or well, the micro LED is going to be shiny and this guy's around the SA node. All right, so we have everything we need now. Before we, we begin ex uh, experiments, you have to know which the stimulation protocol you're gonna be using. For SHAD, um, we typically go from 0.68 milliwatts per millimeter square, um, but we found that 2.4 uh, milliwatts per millimeter square, this is the readings, by the way, is optimal. Optimal meaning that you will have the highest response once you shine the light. Same place, we have um, frequency of 5 hertz, and with a five millisecond pulse. For the TH, or the sympathetic, we use the same readings, uh, 2.4, uh, and the same frequency, but we change the duty cycle here. We go from five to 20%, depending of how intense you want the response. And I'm telling you about this upper limit of 20%, because we've seen that both that, uh, we usually have some major rhythm instability. So if you want to have a smooth change without any um, arrhythmia in the process, I will highly advise you to just stick to 20% for most of the time at least, this is uh, the case. All right, so I just pass you the actual experiment here. Start with chat or the parasympathetic side. The first slide you, you see is you will see a very stable sinus rhythm before stimulation. One thing that, that, that you need to check is every P wave, meaning atrial depolarization, is followed by a QRS complex or ventricular uh, depolarization, meaning that you are in sinus rhythm. Once you shine the light, when the, the, the light is on, in this case, you will see a sudden drop of heart rate. It will be like a step response. And again, you will expect to see a P wave followed by a QRS. In this case, you can see you have sinus bradycardia. You will say, well, probably it's 150 bits per minute for a, for a mouse, that's pretty low. So that's bradycardia. But what happens if something's wrong? So initially you see stable uh, sinus rate, shine the light, and you only look about the your heart rate, you will see, yeah, okay, I have a certain decrease of heart rate, it's working, it's totally fine. But when you look at the ECG, you notice that something's wrong, something's different here. So for instance, in this case, you can see that you have a P wave followed by another P wave, meaning there's no QRS complex, at least one or two P waves. This is AV block or atrioventricular block, meaning that you have a conduction problem in your, in your response. In your, so your heart is not performing the way it should be. It's not having a sinus bradycardia response. So there are several hypotheses that we have. One of those is we are stimulating both the ACA and AV node, and probably you are overstimulating um, the, the, the release of acetylcholine. So a couple of things that you can do here to solve this issue. One is the easiest one is just change the location of the micro LED. Try to hit the sweet spot. Try to, to hit it around the ASA node. That's one of the um, first things that, that we do. You have to verify the illumination area. I mean, if you're, if you're having an LED that's too big or you have a spotlight, most, most, most likely you will hit in both uh, nodes at the same time. You can also decrease your radiance and therefore you can 
decrease a little bit in the, in the, in the response of the release of acid cooling. Those are the couple of tips that, that I can tell you for now because this is the, what works for us for most of the time. Now, what happens if you want to stimulate TH or the sympathetic side? Initially, you have the same response. You have sinus rate, sinus rhythm, P wave, followed by QRS. Once you shine the light, once the light is on, the response is a bit different. I mean, the increase is not as sudden, smooth, and it's like an exponential rise, it, it, you can say. But again, you will see a P wave followed by a QRS. The only difference is that the RR interval is going to be shorter, meaning that the heart rate is increased. So in this case, you have sinus tachycardia. Could be 400, 150, 500. That will highly then depend on the on the heart that you have that day. It's not always going to have the, the same response, but you will expect to see an increase in the heart rate. That's for sure. Now, what happens is if things are not exactly the way you expect here. So what about something wrong for TH? Initially, everything works as usual, sinus rate. But once you shine the light on, you can see that the increase, the heart rate increase is not as smooth. And you start to see some dips and things that shouldn't be there. For instance, PVC, PVC or a premature ventricular contraction. You can definitely see that because you're expecting to see an another QRS complex or P plus QRS complex in a given interval, but this one is too short. And then you have a little space between that contraction and the next one. That's one indication that you have PVC. It could also happen PAC. Happen, um, it's very similar than the way that you can see it. Uh, but in this case, you know, we're, we're dealing with ventricular uh, excitation. Most likely you have PVCs in there. So what can you do here? First thing that you can do is you can change your duty cycle or stimulation. Meaning that probably your heart is, is not at a best shape or a best state at the moment to, to support such high energy demand. So you can probably decrease the duty cycle, which will decrease the increase, uh, it's kind of confusing, no? which decrease the increase of heart rate. So instead of having, for instance, from 250 to 400, probably you decrease your duty cycle, you will have from 250 to 350, for instance, or, or to 300, just to say something. You can also verify the oxygen and the fuel. Talk about the fuel because when you increase the heart rate, your heart will require more energy. So if you have your heart for a couple of hours in a line under perfusion, probably your fuel are gonna be diminished. Probably there are most of the glucose have been consumed and your heart cannot keep up with such energy demand. You can also check the oxygen, for instance, although it's highly unlikely that the oxygen is something new, but depending on the perfusion that you have in there, probably you have, um, you have better oxygen consumption in there. But that's a couple of things that, that, that you, you can try. Man. The main thing and the easiest one is just change the duty cycle. Now, what can we do with the data that we have in there? First of all, you have your ECG, just like I was telling you before. So check for the RR interval. You have an idea what the heart rate is. You check for the PR interval that will give you an idea of the AV conduction. Just like I was telling before, if you have a P wave or anything, there's no QRS, you have another P wave, you know that you have a block, for instance. You can also check for um, um, the duration of the P wave, or the actual uh, precession, the, depending if you have a prolonged P wave or a short P wave, that could be an indication that you have some conduction problems or even a marker for a specific condition, right here, AF. Then, just like I was telling before, you can go as fast as you want, you can have optical mapping. The great thing about having optical mapping data 
is that you have a um, sense of what is happening across the heart. So meaning you have you know exactly what is happening in your ventricles, you know exactly what is happening in your in your atria. So you have more information. And again, you can use this along with the um, with the optogenetic stimulation because most of the time when you stimulate um, uh, the, the dye for, for voltage, uh, uh, voltage recording, there's a lot of options that are not gonna have the same wavelength. Right? The, the channel option that we use, again, has a, a blue light, I mean, for excitation, and you can have like a dye for an X, for instance, for optical mapping, which is a voltage dye, which is around the, um, the excited with green light. So just in case. Uh, you can check the slope, the rate of change for um, the sympathetic side. Of course, you won't have any slope for parasympathetic, it will be zero, it's just like a step response. Uh, but definitely for a sympathetic, you can, you, you can check this. And you can also check um, the difference between max and mean, I mean the maximum response, either the highest increase or the highest decrease, depending if it's sympathetic or parasympathetic, and you can get percent change uh, respect to, um, to your initial conditions. All right, so we know how, how we can do our experience. We know what to expect. We know how we can troubleshoot this. So I'm just gonna keep a brief summary of the key points here. First thing for your model, you have to verify the gene expression. You don't want to waste a couple of hours in experiments wondering why this is not working because I've been there. You don't want to do this. So you want to make sure that your gene expression is there, that child reduction is pressing your neurons, well, or in your cell, depending on what you want to do. You want to get a proper LED, in this case, I like, um, you know, love the micro LEDs, they're very versatile, they're small, compact, they're cheap, and they have the right ratings. Keep stable temperature. Okay, this is, um, initially when I was testing this, uh, I had some fluctuation and I thought, oh yeah, this is working, it's great. But at the end it was just the temperature, it was messing with my experiment, so keep it stable. 37 degrees Celsius, around your system, around your heart, it's, it's important. Ensure proper illumination, meaning that you want to position and place your LED in the right place. You don't want to have AB block, you don't want to, to have any conduction delays or any conduction issues, so make sure that you put it in the right place. I know that probably sometimes it could be a bit frustrating that you try and try at the beginning to um, to get any anything, any response, and you don't get it. But that's all because you don't you haven't hit the right spot, the sweet spot they call. So ensure that you have the proper illumination in the right place. And finally, you have to check for an abnormal ECG. Don't go over say, yes, heart rate is going up, heart rate is going down. That's not the only thing that, that, that you care about. You care that if you have bradycardia, sign of bradycardia, there's no AV conduction uh, delays or issues. You don't want to have any, any issue in there, meaning a P wave is going to be followed by a QRS. That's one way that you can uh, measure that things are going the right place. Of course, you want to be fancy, probably you can have uh, a P wave that is not exactly uh, the uh, right time with respect to QRS or prolongation of the P wave. There are many things that uh, could happen, but at least P wave after QRS is important. Now, everything that I've told you today is just a tip of the iceberg. I mean, there's a bunch of things that you, that you can check. There's more things that, that you can do with the optogenetics. And although this is a recent, uh, relatively recent technology. It's been a huge evolution since day one. So some things that need to be improved, like every day, well not every day, I mean, 
every so often you have new and improved type of options, meaning that you want to have options that are going to be in your host and your, in your, your model, they're going to be safe. They're not going to be toxic, for instance, that you can have a, a deeper light penetration. Like, for instance, we have the rear um, uh, turn reduction. Uh, you have, um, which is a red shifted uh, type of option, meaning that you, you excite a, a red light. Red light has a deeper penetration in your, in your tissue. For instance, for for cardiac um, uh, for cardiac uh, application, they could be beneficial, especially because if you want to go from epicardium to endocardium, you need to have a deeper penetration. Just one one thing to to keep in mind. There's some labs that I mean, using uh, up to edX, you have high throughput testing, meaning that you can have more than 100 samples tested for cardiotoxicity at the same time. Remember that optogenetics is not only about actuators, you can also have sensing uh, options. So you can improve the way that, that you do your experiments just by having this type of testing, for instance. There's a lot of talks about what can you do in terms of cardiac application. The main thing is arrhythmia termination. So, um, there's some labs being we highly focused on determining dangerous arrhythmia, just as ventricular fibrillation or VF, or AF also, atrial fibrillation, um, by depolarizing white areas of the, of the cardiac tissue. Uh, but that's, again, that's just one, one of the applications. Some other labs have used optogenetics to um, use it as a pacemaker, for instance. Instead of using electrical pulses, they use optical pulses to drive um, the heart. And finally, this is something that probably is not in the um, short term, at least for humans, but there's a huge talk of integrating um, bicompatible members to excite already, um, I will say infected, I will say uh, tissue that has expression, that has turn of action expression. So in the future, probably you will have a heart that have turnoxin expression in the cardiomyocytes, for instance, and you will have a bicompatible membrane that is going to excite specific sections of your heart depending on the conditions without having any, um, any significant side effects. Of course, I know that this might sound like sci-fi for now, but I mean, we, we got a dream. I mean, we're all scientists and we want to aim for the best. So, this is everything I have for you today, guys. Uh, I hope you enjoyed. Uh, I really want to thank Dr. Matthew K. from George Washington University. We, um, we did all these experiments in his lab. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for you guys to be here. Um, I hope you enjoy. I hope you learned something. I mean, for me, it was awesome to, to give you this webinar. So if you have any questions, comments, or anything you would like to know, uh, feel free to ask you. Um, yeah. Well, Thank you. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Angel, for a really fantastic presentation. And with that, we're going to move on to the Q&A here. We're going to start with a few questions from registration. Um, so this one says, hi, can you please tell me about natural frequency of action potentials in different cardiac cells and which option is most suitable in terms of kinetics? Okay. Um, well, in, in terms of a natural frequency action potential, you got to look about the excitable cells because there are several non-excitable cells in the um, cardiac, just like fibroblasts or myofibroblasts or cardiac progenitor cells. So you have to go through the excitable, so those are the cardiomyocytes and cardiac uh, pacemaker cells. So every time that you have a contraction, you have an action potential, meaning that depending on, on the situation, you will have different frequency of action potential firing and you have a um, high high rate uh, sorry high heart rate uh, the frequency will be increased uh, and the opposite will happen with um, with the uh, with a decrease of heart rate I mean I don't know if that's what you mean about natural frequency action potential but that's how 
uh, if you call it pacemaker cells are, are driven, is that depending on the conditions um, of your heart, depending on the condition that you're, you're moving at that precise time, that is going to be adapted. And now in terms of which option is suitable, uh, that will highly depend on what you want to do. I mean, you have the polarizing options, you have hyperolizing options, for instance, you in the depolarizing options, you have the channel options, you have the one that, that we're talking about, and we also have a bunch of different mutations for channel options. In this case, you have like the channel option HR or channel option H134R, if I'm not mistaken. Those will create larger uh, photocarins, but will have like a little slower tau, which is the kinetics of tau closer. You also have the red shifted um, uh, red option that I was telling before. You also have, for instance, um, uh, calcium translocating char red option or CAT uh, CH, which is um, uh, option that are more, that has an enhanced calcium permeability and light sensitivity. Um, this depolarizing are the one that are actually, this option are the one that are going to excite or they're going to stimulate the cell. Um, but you also have the hyperpolarizing option, like a halogen option, which is uh, going to stimulate chloride pumps or um, arterial options, for instance, which is a proton pump. Uh, this particular one, for instance, is, I think is um, green light activated. Um, once you generate some hyperpolarizing currents, you can probably see some myocardial contractions and suppress some cardiomyocytic activities, for instance. Um, I know that some labs have used this type of option, the hyperpolarizing hyper option, to uh, treat uh, BF. Um, uh, but yes, I mean, which option is suitable is, is, is up to you, let's say. Fantastic, great answer. Um, next question here, another one from registration, but I'll combine it with one that was asked live. Uh, when measuring cardiac autonomic tone over how long of a time period do you measure? And uh, by extension, we were also asked how long your preparations, your ex vivo preparations can last. Okay, so in terms of how long the ex vivo preparation can last, um, I've had hearts for four hours. After that, I'm too hungry to continue. Um, <laughs> but they're viable after that. But again, you have to to, to be careful to have enough uh, fuel to get your hearts going. Uh, you always selling the glucose, for instance, is very important. Um, measure the cardioautonomic tone. Usually, um, I start low, so. 30 to 60 seconds, meaning that I shine the light, wait 30, 60 seconds, and turn it off, uh, just to make sure that everything is working, everything is fine. But um, I've had uh, experiments that I've used uh, simulation for over half an hour or more, and I still see the, 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 the response. Uh, of course, if you have uh, the sympathetic uh, side probably that won't last that long because um, the energy demand is too high and probably the, the vesicles are going to be depleted. That's just a hypothesis that we have. But for the parasympathetic side, um, chances are that it will last longer than that. Yeah, so I, I, I've, I've done it for at least half an hour, I would say. Fantastic. Um, all right, question here from Jerome, who's asked, what is the depth of light penetration in the tissue? Well, that depends also on the light that may be used. Um, for blue light, sometimes you can go like two to four millimeters, probably tops. Uh, red light could be the double. We double in that, but that that highly depends on the wavelength, and the wavelength that you're going to be using depends on the option that you use as well. 
Perfect. Yeah, uh, he he actually added a comment here. With new options in near infrared, you'll improve penetration but decrease power. And so there's a bit of a balance that you have to make there. Um, okay, so David here has asked, what control do you use to reduce the effect of heat on neurons that do not express channel rhodopsin? Hmm. So heat, I mean, like thermal transfer from the micro LED. I tried to use the what I was telling the PDBS to prevent to have any heat transfer in there. In terms of control, um, so we've done some some tests with uh, well type mice, meaning that there is no uh, churn adoption. In, in any in any neurons, we try just um, um, to shine the light just like the the same way that we usually do with um, with the optogenetics uh, mice, and we don't see any any change, meaning that we don't have any increase or decrease. Well, in this case, it will be if you have heat, you will have an increase. We don't see any any increase in heart rate. Um, if that what you what you meant by heat, I don't know if I answered your question like that. Yes, uh, if you if that answers your question, uh, perfect. If not, yeah, you can specify in uh, the response in the ask a question box. Um, another question here: Do is your ex vivo uh, setup is it commercially available or is it uh, in lab built? I mean, both, I will say. I mean, there are some companies that will sell you the whole the whole rig, I mean, every single piece that, that you can use for a Langendorf, or you can do just like I did. I mean, I pretty much built my own Langendorf, so it's possible, yes, to just build it like that. And in terms of the, I mean, for the perfusion system, for the model per se, for the optogenetics, um, yes, there are some companies that will sell you the mice with a specific gene expression. Um, in our case, we bought the, the parents and we maintain our own colony and house. Um, and for the LEDs, uh, you can buy either the micro LEDs, which are perfectly uh, available, with, or you can buy like white, white area or spotlights, which costs you a bit, but uh, you can also buy those. Yes, but uh, short answer: yes, you can build it your, your, yourself, and you can also go commercially. Yes. Fantastic. Um question here from Matthew who says, great technique and nice overview. Uh, the stimulation frequency was five hertz for both parasympathetic and sympathetic stimulation, which is quite different from normal activation frequencies on these nerves. Uh, I appreciate that this is different from electrical stimulation, but is this relevant and does changing frequency as opposed to brightness influence what happens? Uh, and is this simply a rhodopsin activation effect or a stimulation frequency event? Uh, stimulation frequency effect. Okay, so um, the five hertz uh, frequency that we use is because we try many different frequencies to see which one was the most optimal uh, frequency in this case. So, for instance, below five hertz, yes, you will see, um, uh, I will say, less impact in the in the response. But above five hertz. Like five, uh, seven, eight hertz. It was very similar the the response that, that we that, that we saw in there. And you're right. I mean, is the frequency is very different than the natural frequency you will expect. Like for instance, when you're um, when you're stimulating the vagus nerve for people suffering from epilepsy, for instance, uh, frequencies are about twenty hertz, which is much higher <laughs> than the the ones that, that that we use here. But five hertz in our case is is the one that we found uh, to be the most optimal one. 
in terms of the reduction um, in kinetics, uh, I will say that depending of the of the um, of the applicability that you have in there, because for instance, there there are some so instances that you have channel reduction that are attached to cardio mile size, so the frequency is going to be driven by how fast or slow your heart is going to go. Um, but in our case, that's not the the case per se because we're not um, we're we're not controlling the heart rate uh, by 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 stimulating cardiac myocyte, but by stimulating neurons. So it's different than the way that we do it. So um, it's more like a, a a frequency effect, I will say. In in, in our case, a five hertz was the the sweet spot. Bit different than uh, what you should expect for normal uh, neuron stimulation. Yep. Excellent. Great answer. And I think in the interest of time, we'll just have one last question here. Uh, it is, can optogenetic stimulation be used in intact animals or does it require a Langendorf prep? Uh, can you stimulate cardiac sympathetics and parasympathetics in vivo? Um. Technically, I will say yes. I, I, I haven't done it. I mean, most, most of the time we've done it is um, ex vivo. The thing is that when you have an in vivo uh, approach, once you you open the chest cavity, uh, you have to have a, an, an animal intubated, and we couldn't do that at that time. But technically, yes. I mean, I will, I will go that it's possible. Um, people have used it. Uh, I've used optogenetics in vivo, uh, not precisely for neurons, for sorry, for cardiac neurons, but for other type of tissue. Yes, they they they've, they've done it and that works just fine. But um, in our case that we have, uh, they want to stimulate specific the neurons on top of the or the one that are embedded in, in your heart. You you will have to intubate. Um, that's the next step for us. I mean, we want to go in vivo. Um, but yeah, no, that's a great question. Fantastic. Yeah, really interesting avenues in the future for sure. Um, but thanks so much, Dr. Moreno, for all your really fantastic insights today. Uh, it's been a real pleasure having you with us. Oh, thank you. I mean, thank you for the invitation again. And thanks, everyone, for, for being here and for your great questions, too. Yeah, certainly big thanks to everyone for joining us for attending the webinar. And of course, we'd also like to thank AD Instruments for sponsoring this event. So in closing, thanks again for taking part in this American Physiological Society and Inside Scientific webinar. And we look forward to having you with us again soon. Have a great day, everyone.